Welcome everyone. Lovely to, to be together for this time of, of uh, practice, creating a clearing in the dense forest of our lives, taking this kind of time together, practicing together in Sangha, in community, which uh, the Buddha spoke about as all of the spiritual practices is community, is, is practicing in community. So it's appreciating our, our uh, ability to practice together in these continually, continuing to be difficult times with uh, COVID and the Delta and, um, and uh, appreciating, great, grateful that in our different places, lots of folks from outside of our area now, um, that we can all be, all be together. And also um, remembering, you know, just remembering this weekend, this um, yesterday's anniversary, 20th anniversary of 9-11 and how just the, um, the pain of that and the loss of that, the loss of life and, you know, the loved ones continuing to suffer it, suffer through the years and all that came out of that, you know, in terms of policies that are still, still being played out and still, um, just recognizing that and uh, acknowledging that part of you know, this this time where we're living in, and uh, yeah, so just to uh, to welcome everyone here for the first time uh, is new. I think most people have are recidivists back uh, after many, many times together. Um, but if you're here for the first time, I'm Hugh Byrne. I teach with the Insight Meditation Community of Washington, IMCW, and the Center for Mindful Living. And this is a class that's hosted by IMCW and hosted by the, by the center, which is part of IMCW and physically located when we are together on uh, Wisconsin Avenue in Northwest Washington, DC. It's lovely that we can be together in our various different parts of the country and parts of the world and, uh, and practice together. And um, just a little um, about the format is it's, it's pretty straightforward. We, we typically begin with a period of meditation, maybe 20, 25 minutes of, of meditation to help us arrive and settle. Then I'll do a short talk, share some reflections. The theme today is letting go, letting go, which is kind of a fairly important concept practice in uh, in uh, in Buddhist Buddhist teachings, Buddhist practice. So letting go. Then uh, then Emily will lead us in some mindful movement. It's always a lovely part of our time together. Then we'll do some sharing, depending on time. Um, hopefully we'll have time today to do some breakout groups. And then we'll come back together again, share in the full group. And we'll finish with, a, with another shorter meditation to, to finish up our time together and then have a few announcements. And, um, and then we'll finish and... Uh, with the opportunity um, to continue afterwards in an informal way um, during uh, lunch for half an hour or 45 minutes or so afterwards. So let's, uh, let's just take some moments to, to arrive and settle. So um, come into a posture that's comfortable and relaxed, you know, and just sitting sitting in a way that you can be comfortable for this period of 20, 25 minutes. If you'd like to, you could close your eyes, let your attention come inward, or if you prefer, just keep the eyes open with a soft, unfocused gaze, maybe looking ahead of you a few feet. Just let your awareness come into the body, consciously dropping down out of the, the thinking mode. We spend so much of our time thinking, planning, remembering. 
and just letting, letting yourself arrive. Inviting the shoulders to relax. Let the chest be open so you can breathe easily. Hands can be in the lap or on your knees or thighs, whatever's comfortable. And you might take a, a few longer, deeper breaths to help you arrive, settle, just be here. So a nice deep in breath, filling the lungs, filling the chest. And then releasing, letting go on the out breath. As you breathe out, just imagine you're breathing out any stresses, any tensions or contraction, just letting them go. Breathing in, just inviting a calming of the body and the mind. And breathing out, letting go. Breathing in, calming the body. Breathing out, calming the mind. Relaxing the body, relaxing the mind. And whenever you're ready, just letting the, letting the breath settle back into its natural rhythm. In breath and out breath. <clears throat> Another way we can invite a sense of relaxation is to, to consciously invite a smile to the face. So imagine you're looking in the eyes of a loved one or somebody who makes you feel happy and joyful. Just take in that feeling of, feeling of joy, feeling of happiness. If you can, just let that spread through your body. Take in the, any good feelings that are present. <clears throat> the smile sends a message to our nervous system and to our brain that we can, we can be at ease. We don't have to be hypervigilant. It invites a sense of ease and well-being. You might invite the smile down into the area of your heart. Letting the smile be a, an expression of how you, how you want to meet, meet each moment as it's arising, as it's unfolding. Letting yourself Settle, arrive. As anything that feels difficult or challenging, you might just put your hand on your heart, maybe another hand on the belly. Just take in a feeling of caring for yourself caring for your well-being, for your happiness. Take that in, take in the good. Just being here, opening to what's present in the body, the heart, the mind. You might just bring, bring awareness to your bodily feelings. 
noticing what's present, making space for whatever is here. Just feeling a space around, around the feeling, particularly if it's difficult. Just holding whatever is here with kindness, with acceptance. You might bring your awareness to any mood or emotion that might be present. Maybe there's a feeling of heaviness or a little bit of sadness around the eyes or around the heart. Maybe there's a feeling of joy or excitement. Whatever is here, see if you can just recognize and allow. Welcome the guests in, in Rumi's words, his metaphor. Even if there are a crowd of sorrows who sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. And notice how the mind is right now. Is it calm and settled? Or is it busy, active, and jumping around, or somewhere in between? And the practice is just to notice, not to get rid of any feelings or any experiences, but just be aware. Let's shine the light of awareness on what is present. Meeting what's here with, with kindness, with acceptance, with curiosity, with interest. Dorothy Hunt says, peace is this moment without judgment. This moment in the heart space where everything that is, is welcome. This moment in the heart space where everything that is, is welcome. <clears throat> So inviting a receptive awareness to whatever is present right now. You know, the guests coming to visit. We could think of our experience of like changing weather systems. You know, at times it's, it's like a sunny day, things are calm and peaceful. Other days feel more stormy, more turbulent. And there's worry or there's fear <clears throat> or there's anger. But all can be met with the same kind, accepting awareness. Just this. It's like this. Sadness, it's like this. Tightness is like this.
I'll share Holly Hughes poem mind wanting more just going to drop it into into our awareness only a beige slat of sun above the horizon like a shade pulled not quite down otherwise clouds sea rippled here and there birds reluctant to fly the mind wants a shaft of sun to stir the gray porridge of clouds an osprey, osprey to stitch the sea to sky with its barred wings, some dramatic music, a symphony, perhaps a Chinese gong. But the mind always wants more than it has. One more bright day of sun, one more clear night in bed with the moon, one more hour to get the words right, one more chance for the heart in hiding, to emerge from its thicket in dried grasses. As if this quiet day with its tentative light weren't enough, as if joy weren't strewn all around. opening to what's here with kindness, with care, with acceptance. <clears throat> if it's helpful, just letting the attention rest on the breath, the experience of the body breathing, in breath and out breath. And that can be a, a home base where we rest our attention, where we cultivate this quality of awareness, of kind, loving awareness. Then when the mind goes off as it will at times, maybe often. We just incline the attention back, incline the mind back, back to the breath, back to the body, here, now, just this, beginning again in any moment. Whatever's here, can you meet it with kindness? Now the hand, just the simple gesture of a hand on, a, on the heart, maybe another on the belly. Just that message of caring for yourself, for your experience. As Martha Postlethwaite says in her poem, Clearing, do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is yours alone to sing 
falls into your open cupped hands and you recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worthy of rescue. You think of this as creating that space in the dense forest of your life. And just opening to whatever may come out of the silence, the stillness, is this being here. I can always begin again, no matter how many times, how long we're off somewhere in thought, caught up in stories, memories, daydreams. I can always just come back. This moment, this experience is, is always just a, just a moment away, just a, a shift in attention away and we're home again. finish the meditation with this poem by Diane Ackerman, a poem, School Prayer. In the name of the daybreak and the eyelids of morning and the wayfaring moon and the night when it departs, I swear I will not dishonor my soul with hatred, but offer myself humbly as a guardian of nature, as a healer of misery, as a messenger of wonder, as an architect of peace. In the name of the sun and its mirrors, and the day that embraces it, and the cloud veils drawn over it, and the uttermost night, and the male and the female, and the plants bursting with seed, and the crowning seasons of the firefly and the apple, I will honour all life, wherever and in whatever form it may dwell on earth my home and in the mansions of the stars. So welcome again, everyone, and welcome if you joined us um, after we began today.
what I'd like to do is um, <clears throat> is to share some some thoughts, some reflections on um, the theme of letting letting go, and uh, to say that um, we talk a, a lot in Buddhist teachings about letting go. You know, you could say letting go is really at the core of of the Buddha's teachings. Um, the teaching that, that letting go leads to freedom from suffering. So I want to talk today about, about letting go and talk about what we mean when we, when we talk about letting go. What are, we, what are we letting go of and how are we letting go and why are we letting go and why it's important in our lives. You know, why is letting go important and how we go about it. You know, what are the practices that help us to do that? <clears throat> so I want to begin just with some reflections about, you know, what, what do we mean by letting go and what are we letting go of? In the, in the Buddha's teachings, as I think you probably know, the core, quote, problem in our lives is that we get caught up in suffering. Um, and suffering isn't just ba a bad thing happening. You know, it's not, it's not exactly what we mean when we, when we use that word in English. You know, we typically equate it with, with something bad. Oh, you know, somebody's lost a loved one or there's been a tragedy or whatever. And obviously those situations can, may well have suffering involved with them, but something bad can happen and it may not lead to suffering. And the reason really is that, you know, what the Buddhist understanding of suffering is, is that for us to suffer, we have to in some way be implicated in the suffering. We have to be doing something or not doing something, you know, clinging or resisting. We have to be in a kind of relationship with our experience that turns it <clears throat> that turns anything into suffering. The event or the thing that happens, you know, is a part of it, but in itself isn't isn't suffering. You know, the suffering is is what, in part at least, what we <clears throat> what we bring to the experience. So it's really the coming together of you know, it might be something, you know, some unexpected loss, you know, on one hand, and then our reaction to that. So there's always the kind of the two, those two parts to it, the conditions and the causes. And, you know, what are we, how, how am I engaging with this? How am I relating to this? So we're involved in it. We're relating to it, whether it's to a person or a thing or a situation, in some way, in an unskillful way. <clears throat> We're doing something or not doing something that is causing us to suffer. To suffer. The Buddha termed what we're doing, he called it craving. And craving, you know, in terms of suffering, um, Craving in, you know, has a, you know, in our, you know, understanding it's, it's kind of linked a lot to that, that kind of wanting, that grasping, kind of an addictive quality of like holding on and craving. And that's definitely one dimension of it. But it also includes more than that as well. It includes the kind of resistance we get caught up in. I hate this. I hate this situation. I hate this person. You know that. And we're contracted around that. Then that also is, is what the Buddha spoke about as craving. It could be just being disconnected, you know, when just not aware of our experience fully. And, and that can be suffering, suffering too. Typically, you know, it involves we're wanting things to be other than they are. I mean, that's a big part of it. We're wanting this situation to be different. We want more of the things we like. We want to get rid of the things we don't like. We want to push them away, wanting them to be different, wanting something we don't have. So essentially being in that unskillful relationship with our experience. So just think of some examples. You know, we're angry about people, let's say, not getting vaccinated. 
and we're caught up in judgments about them. And the anger itself isn't necessarily suffering. We could get, you know, we could be angry. You think of Jesus in the temple, you know, turning the money lenders' tables over in the, in the New Testament of the Bible of, you know, there's an anger that the temple, this holy place is being used for these very, you know, kind of nefarious activities, very, very unspiritual activities, if you like, you know, buying and selling and lending and all of that. And, and, uh, and righteous anger, you know, there, there could be, you could have righteous anger without, without there being suffering involved in it, you know, if it's wise and if it's compassionate. But when, when we're suffering, that there's a way in which we're hooked on our anger or we're hooked on our craving. There's this sense of it's not, it's not a flowing relationship. It's not like, okay, some anger comes and we kind of say, you know, maybe we say something and then we let it go. Somehow we're holding on to something. It's that holding on quality that's really a key. We're really hooked on our anger or we're hooked on our craving. And I'll come back to, you know, I'll, I'll come back to that term being hooked in a minute. You know, it could be the, you know, we wish we lived in a, a nicer house or in a different neighborhood or had a different job. Or we wish we were in a relationship. If we're not in a relationship, you know, there's a lot of suffering can come of, oh, I wish I was. I feel so alone. And it's when we get hooked into those typically into a story in our mind about how we wish things were different. And we get kind of hooked on that, you know, or I wish I was out of a relationship if we're in a situation that's a difficult or a painful one. So there's that quality of, of being, being hooked. Or we worry, we worry of like, will I have enough to live on? Or worried about, oh, am I going to get laid off with, oh, you know, what's going on? Or, or we're anxious about our health or about the how a family member is living their lives. You know, in some way, again, it's just to be clear, we can, we can have all of those, any of those concerns. And if we have them in a discerning way, like, oh, I'm, I'm you know, thinking of my child or my cousin or whatever and what they're doing and I don't see them living their lives in a healthy way I could I could experience that you know those thoughts with discernment of like caring and maybe if I can do something about it can I do something about it but what I'm actually talking about is not that discerning it's when we in some way get hooked on the on on the situation we it's almost like we're the, we're a dog like a dog with a bone and we can't put it down you know we're worrying worrying or we're fearful or we keep getting drawn back to that you know politician that we don't like and we you know and we you know i thought oh they're terrible what an awful person this you know x is and you know, we're caught up in that. It's that really that quality of being being hooked that I'm talking about. That's really a key element of, of uh, what the Buddha talked about as suffering. So we're wanting life to be other than it is. And when it's not, we suffer. This notion of craving or clinging is at the root of our unhappiness and our suffering, you know, according to the Buddha's teachings, you know. What we're doing is we're really making a mistake. We're not seeing things as they are. We're mistaking them, mistaking them. We're taking them wrong. We're not seeing them as they are. We're not seeing things with wisdom, with discernment, and so we suffer. We think that, you know, if you think of the extreme example of somebody who's addicted to a substance, you know, and they think, oh, I've got to have this, got to have this. And they equate their well-being with the getting of that thing. We all know that, you know, where there's that addictive quality of mind, we, we want it. Then even getting it is going to maybe provide relief for a limited amount of time, but it's not going to end the, end the suffering. It's not going to end the craving. So we're mistaking things, mistaking things. You know, I've talked uh, um, <clears throat> before in, I brought this up before in, in talks of um, Pema Chodron uses the Tibetan word, um, which captures this idea of being hooked. 
And the word is Shempa, S-H-E-N, N for Norman, P-A, Shempa. Really the idea of being hooked. And you could think of it as like a fish being caught on a hook. You know, we can't get away from, we can't undo ourselves. We may see that we're hooked. We may experience the pain of being hooked, but we're still not able to get unhooked. And this is the nature of of suffering. It's the nature of craving. It's the nature of of shempa, (coughs) of this kind of quality of being hooked. So in the Buddha's teachings, the cause of suffering is craving, clinging. This is the second noble truth. The first one is, the first noble truth is, there's the experience of suffering, the experience of not wanting things to be as they are, you know, the different expressions of that. The second is, uh, craving is the cause of suffering. But the liberating insight of the Buddha's teachings is that when we see that we're hooked and how we're hooked, we can let go and we can realize the deepest freedom. This is the third noble truth. So the second noble truth and the third noble truth really are kind of different sides of the same coin. We're hooked because we get get caught up. We get caught up in in holding on to what we want, what we're we're craving or what we want to get rid of. But if we see this, then, then we can let go of clinging. This is where the letting go comes in. And when we let go, we can realize the deepest freedom possible in this this human life. Complete freedom from suffering is possible. So we can see how we can let go of clinging and, and, and we can experience freedom from suffering some reason the lines from Leonard Cohen's song, The Sisters of Mercy comes to mind. He says, when I've been where you're hanging, I think I can see how you're pinned. If you're not feeling holy, your loneliness says that you've sinned. It's Leonard. So clinging, so this very simple, um, if you like, um, statement of the Four Noble Truths is that clinging leads to suffering and letting go of clinging leads to the ending of suffering. See that as a short version of the Four Noble Truths. So the question then about letting go, why is this understanding of suffering and the cause of suffering and the potential for ending suffering and the path the fourth noble truth, the path to ending suffering. Why is this, (coughs) excuse me, why is this understanding, this teaching so important? For me, the teaching is so important, this understanding is important because it's an understanding, a way of seeing and a way of living that leads to the deepest freedom possible in this life. So it's a way of seeing our experience through the lens of suffering and the end of suffering, what causes suffering, how we let go of suffering. It's a way of seeing, a way of looking that actually frees us. It has a material impact on our lives to so that we can live in a different way in the world. We can live with ease you know i often come back to you know this the metaphor of dancing with life we can be in this fluid relationship with our experience where we don't have to contract about oh things have to be like this for me to be okay i've got to get rid of this bad thing bad thing for things to be okay i've got to have the things i want you know we see through that illusion that our happiness isn't fundamentally tied up to, with getting what we want or getting what we think we need, but rather in transforming our relationship to our experience. It's about letting go 
of clinging to any way of seeing, any way of holding on to our experience. This leads to freedom. So it's the, it's the outcome that's important. It's this way of seeing, you know, it's one of many different ways of seeing. We could look at the world and say, you know, it's a dog-eat-dog world, everyone out for themselves, and the only way I'll be able to, you know, survive here is to really just be, be, be you know, take look out for myself and maybe a few of my loved ones. And that's another view of the world. But it's a view of the world that's going to lead to suffering because out of that view will tend to come intentions and actions and speech that just keep me separated from others, keep me caught up in contraction. You know, these people are going to take what I have or what do I have to do to, you know, to be secure, to be safe. I'm going to be caught up in those, that, that kind of contraction. So the Buddha says this way of seeing, this way of looking at our experience through the lens really of these teachings of suffering and the end of suffering. Clinging causes suffering, letting go of clinging leads to the end of suffering. That th This leads to freedom and that's why it's worth exploring. That's why it makes a difference in our lives. But he said, don't just believe this. He said, see for yourself, test it out in experience. So my invitation, you know, to you and to myself is to, is to take this kind of this framework, this way of seeing and apply it to our lives. I mean, it's not a theoretical con conceptual thing. It's about how we're living. And whenever, whenever you're suffering, ask yourself, how am I implicated in this? What, if anything, am I holding on to here? If, we're, <clears throat> if our suffering is we're caught up in anger with you know, a friend or a colleague at work or whatever, and where they're doing this and they're doing not doing that and they should be doing this and a mind gets keep pull, get, keeps getting pulled back into that. When you notice that arising, just ask yourself, you know, what am I holding on to here? What am I believing here? What am I clinging to here that is keeping me kind of on the wheel of suffering, just keeping things going? It's like I'm, there's a fire and I'm just throwing more fuel on the fire, you know, just to, and the fire keeps going. And what we're wanting to do really is to, is to put out the fire. We're wanting to let the fire kind of run its course and, you know, or kind of like not, not, not cause damage, etc. So look at it in your own life. Where am I suffering? What is my role in this suffering? <clears throat> You know, maybe just thinking this person should be different than they are. I don't like the way they're acting towards me. They should be different. Byron Katie, who does, you know, a lot of work on kind of un unpacking beliefs and, you know, wonderful teacher, you know, she, she in counsels has asked, you know, is this true that this person should be different than they are? This is how they are. You know, and as long as I'm believing that they should be different, then I'm going to be suffering because I'm not going to control whether they are different or not. You know, maybe they change, but I'm still going to have this, this underlying craving unless I've addressed it in, in practice, unless I've worked at what's underneath the kind of the external expression of it. So look at it in your own life. What is my own role in this suffering? And what happens if I can let go of this clinging? What happens if I say, this person right now is just showing up in my life, in the world as they are? Can that be okay? Can I just not be in a struggle with that? You know, maybe I have to practice doing that, cultivate loving kindness, cultivate compassion, be willing to be with the the arrows when they hit and like they say something and we get reactive. Okay, can I just let this come and let this go? You know, I've, I've spoken about in the past, when we're, when we're suffering, there's always a second arrow. There's always something we're adding on to the experience. 
this should be different. They should be like this. I want this. I need to have this. So what happens when we let go of that, when we just bring awareness to it and choose to just to choose to let the feelings come and let them go without, you know, throwing more, more fuel on the fire? And what are the practices that can help me to let go? This is where the fourth noble truth comes in, what the Buddha called the Eightfold Path, this training in wisdom, in meditation, and in, um, in ethics, in living, living wisely and kindly in the world. So how do we let go in practice? I think before we can let go, we have to be aware of our clinging. We have to be aware that we're suffering, and we have to be aware you know, of, of what we're doing that is keeping, is perpetuating really the, the suffering. We have to bring it into the light of awareness, see the pain that it's causing us. And to see that clinging is actually, as I spoke about before, is actually a mistake, is taking things the wrong way, looking for happiness where it can't be found. We're thinking if we only had the thing we wanted, you know, if only I didn't have to work with this person or if only, you know, we could take this action to change something in the world, then I'd be happy, then I'd be satisfied. But the nature of clinging is that it can never be satisfied without going to the roots. Because even if we do get the thing we want or get rid of the, what we don't want, Unless the wanting, the craving, the clinging, the aversion is addressed, then the suffering will continue. You know, just the example I gave of the addict, you know, thinking needing the fix, needing the drug, feels if only I get this drug, I'll be okay. But we know that getting and taking the drug will actually only strengthen the addiction, strengthen, strengthen that craving quality. So we have to see that, become aware of it. And when we do, then letting go becomes possible. So our practice really is to stop fueling the unskillful relationship with our experience. Stop throwing fuel on the fire. That's really the starting point. See that we're doing that like that we're believing this person needs to be different. This situation has to change. I don't like this. I don't want this. And we're just continuing to kind of fuel it by our thoughts, by the stories, by the beliefs in our mind. So the practice is really to stop doing that, just to pause, come back to the body, come back to the breath. Whatever the, whatever, the unskillful relationship is, whether it's craving, whether it's worrying or blaming or judging, just to observe the thought without getting hooked on it and creating more thoughts. So the thought comes up, oh, that person, I'm going to give them a piece of my, okay, notice that, let it come, let it go. Rather than just saying, yes, I'm so right in thinking that, and they're such a terrible person. And the more I think that, and the more I just keep doing that, the more I strengthen this quality of being hooked, the more I get hooked on this, in this unskillful relationship with my experience. So stop fueling the fire, stop throwing fuel on the fire. Come back to the body, come back to the feelings. Typically, we'll be experiencing something difficult or unpleasant in the body, you know, tight, tense. And rather than feeling that, we tend to go straight into the thoughts. Oh, they're this, they're that. You know, this politician is like this. This situation is like this. We try and solve things out there. I often come back to <clears throat> what, uh, what James Baldwin, the great, writer and activist said you know 50 60 years ago he said i think one of the reasons people cling so strongly to their hate is that they see that if they let go of their hate 
they'd have to feel their own pain. If they were to really let go of their, if they were to let go of their hate, they'd have to feel their own pain. And we don't want to feel our own pain. So it's easy to direct it outward into hatred, into blame, into judgment, into conflict. You know, we see it so much around us in our society. Rather than feeling our pain, we go into our kind of tribal allegiances. We go into we're right, they're wrong. You know, and I'm not saying there's no difference between, you know, you know, certain policies rather than other policies without getting into details. But, but, but it's when, when, we get cl- when we get into clinging and we get hooked, whatever our view is, even if it's a very clear, insightful view and it's for the benefit of all beings, if we're clinging to it, we're going to suffer and we're going to help perpetuate suffering, suffering by creating separation. Because if we cling then we're creating something other out there, you know, something, something, you know, that we're protecting ourselves against, those people who think some different than, it, than I do. So we come back, we experience the feelings, we let them come and go, as we do in meditation, opening, making space, letting them come, letting them go, letting them be. We feel the feelings, we see their impermanence. You know, once we start letting go of letting go of the hook, then we can see that everything's changing. When we're hooked, we don't see it. We're so tightly wound around the thing we want. We've lost that awareness, we've lost that ability to see clearly. It's like that circle, and below the line is the unconscious, above the line is the conscious. We need to bring what is unconscious, particularly when it's harmful to us. We need to bring it into awareness. We need to say, oh, okay, I'm fueling this. I'm putting more more fuel on the fire. So we see their impermanence. We see that these changing sensations and feelings and thoughts, they're not me or my. They're just experiences coming out of different causes and conditions. And if I don't hold on to them, they'll just come and go like like a weather, like a, a storm passing through. So without the fuel, the fearful or the angry or the craving thoughts, don't go anywhere. When we stop fueling, fueling them, they cease to have a life of their own, because their continued existence is based really on our unskillful action and our thoughts. In Buddhism, we talk about a dependent arising, that nothing has an independent existence. Nothing just exists permanently, you know, as a separate thing or experience in itself. Everything is coming out of causes and conditions. If I feel, if I'm suffering around a loss I've experienced, as I've said, it's it's not just the loss that's creating the suffering. There's the loss, there's the actual experience of the loss of the relationship or the loved one. There's that, but there's also what I bring into that, bring together with that loss. And if I'm suffering, there's, there will be an unskillful relationship that I'm bringing in. I'm bringing in resistance or I'm bringing in judgment or I'm bringing in clinging. And so it's that dependent arising, those things coming together, the underlying conditions and the response that leads to the suffering. And so if we can change the way we respond to the underlying conditions, then we change the suffering. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't continue, you know, as it did before. You know, ultimately, you know, this is spoken about as emptiness in, in, <clears throat> in, in the Buddhist teachings. You know, or everything is empty of 
permanent separate existence you know so if i don't fuel the suffering there isn't any suffering if i bring a, a wise relationship and a compassionate relationship even to what may be a, a dreadfully you know painful situation if i meet that with an open heart with kindness with space then suffering doesn't arise even though the situation itself might be a very a very painful one so how we meet our experience is critical to our suffering. And this is where the letting go comes in. That, that, that letting go, you know, it's really important. I think I'll finish with this. It's, we can sometimes confuse letting go with getting rid of or pushing away an experience. But pushing away experiences doesn't tend to get rid of them, at least not for long. You know, as Jung said, what you resist persists. We try and push something away. It'll come in the back door or through the, through the side window. It's more helpful to think, think of letting go as letting be. We're really not interfering with our experience. So it's a quality of non-interference, non-resistance, non-clinging, non-judging. So very much a a kind of letting be, awareness, kindness, seeing impermanence, seeing that nothing can be held on to as I or mine. And when we cultivate this way of being, this way of seeing, we let go of the struggle. As Arjun Chah says, let go a little, you'll experience a little peace, a little freedom. Let go a lot and you'll experience a lot of peace. Let go completely and you'll experience complete peace, complete freedom. Your struggle with the world will be at an end. Your struggle with the world will be at an end. So just take a, a moment or two as we finish off this piece today. Just take, take in what's present for you right now. Just ask yourself, is there anything that I'm holding on to? right now that I might let go of. Any clinging, anything, any resistance to your experience. Can you invite a letting go? Really a letting be. Letting this moment be just as it is, letting it come, letting it go. David White says, enough, these few words are enough. If not these words, this breath. If not this breath, this sitting here, this opening to the life we have refused again and again until now, until now. So invite uh, Emily to, to lead us in some, some movement. Ready? Thank you, Hugh. Thank you. Um, yeah, powerful, powerful words. So let's open up into the space stretch by moving from side to side, swinging our arms. And then expand your arms out wide, turning the palms up and reach up. Allow your shoulders to sink down, the elbows to soften, and then grasp the left wrist in your right hand. Inhale, reach out towards the right, and exhale lower down. Breathing here, deep breath into the rib cage on the left side. And then inhale up, switch hands, and reaching out to the left, exhale, 
tilt, allowing your breath to move into that right rib cage. And exhale, see what you could soften. Inhale up, float your arms into cactus arms. And as you exhale, drop your arms, keeping your elbows up. Inhale up, exhale. Inhale up, exhale. Inhale up. Stretch out your arms, turn your left palm up. Your right palm stays, keep faces down. And on an inhale, switch, bringing the right palm up and the left down or over and switch and switch and switch and to the right and exhale, roll your shoulders, <laughs> allowing them to be free. Roll them the other way. Just getting into different places in your back and shoulders. Good. And then grasp your hands at the back of your waist. Another shoulder move. Inhale, draw your chest open and up. Exhale, draw your arms together, lengthening them past your waist, your hands but past your waist. And Come back up to the waist. Inhale, lifting up again. Exhale, draw your arms down. And then back to the waist. Inhale and move your shoulders together. And move them the other way, gently, good. Last movement will be a forward bend, extend, into a flat back. Notice your hips. They could, uh, if you give them a bit more, well, tilt your body so your hips are a little past your heels to extend. And then when you're ready, lower down. Allow your body to be pulled by gravity. Only go as low as you might want to as low as is safe for you, but do allow, allow your breath to flow easily, comfortably. And then draw your hands above your knees, press on your feet and bring your hands to heart center as you lift up. And thank you all very much for this moment. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Thank you. So good to get into the body. Let's just take a couple of minutes. If anyone has anything you'd like to share or any questions anyone has, um, please raise your hand, either um, your literal hand or your um, virtual hand, as it were, um, either way. How's everyone doing? Good. Were you able to let go? Let go a little? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Perfect. Yeah. My grip on reality has been released. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Hugh, the, this class was like, they're all great. But today, the letting go is the most important thing for me. That, that brings peace alone in every situation so thank you thank you for sharing that with us and everybody oh my gosh this is the ultimate <laughs> thank you where, where, what do you find Pam uh, um, you, you're most in need of letting go of you know where do you find yourself most hooked any if, if you'd like to share anything about that sure I, I think 
the difficulty often is trying to change people and not accepting them for who they are. And like with your loved ones, um, and it extends not only to your loved ones, but, you know, just everybody in a work situation. And as you mentioned, judging other people. And um, I think just being aware, like, like you said, that you're upset, you have a disagreement, you know, the mask thing, the vaccinations, I'm with the public all the time and it can consume you. And then once you just, you, you admit to yourself, listen, that pisses me off, but you know what? They're people and I love everybody. So that calms me down. Um, and just being aware over and over and over again, because there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of craziness. And, and, um, but, but I think the more I practice this of really embracing human beings for who they are, they're precious. We're all different. And I don't have to agree with them either. Yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, I think you've really hit your, hit the nail on the head or hit your head on the nail, as the case may be, that, um, that um, yeah, if you can get to the place, and it is, it is practice, it is work, to the place that, you know, this person is showing up as another, you know, human being with all, you know, all of their, you know, uniqueness and all of that. There's a teacher on the West Coast, some of you may know him or of him, uh, Gil Fronstahl, a great, wonderful teacher out in Palo Alto area. And he had a, a term that I, you know, when he was speaking of what we might call a difficult person, he would say, oh, he's an original or she's an original. <laughs> And it was like very non-judging, you know, but just kind of, yeah, they're unique, you know, <laughs> they're doing some, you know, maybe doing some things we might think of as very strange, you know, of kind of, no, I don't like this. Just this is this person's an original. And it kind of puts put some space there so there's less of that being caught on the hook. It's like, okay, this person is showing up as they're showing up. If we can get to that place life becomes a lot less problematical, a lot, a lot less tricky. I found that over the years in my own practice. That's been one of the things I would say has been one of, you know, a thing that I really see as having changed. I'm much less likely to get hooked. I mean, maybe I get hooked, but I can let go. You know, I say, okay, this is how this person is is uh, is showing up right now. This is how they are. This is what the conditions of their life has led them to, you know, to be to show up in this way. And particularly when we think of politicians, you know, because politicians are so, you know, can be so, you know, cre you know, really trigger us. You know, if they're if they're doing things, saying things, you know, and that we disagree with. But okay, this is how they're showing up as well. Can I? And and it is a practice, you know. It is a okay. I'm I'm hooked. Can I let go? I'm hooked again. Can I let go? And just keep practicing, opening up the space to letting go. So it sounds like your approach, you know, particularly you know, you're in a challenging place working with the public as a flight attendant and. You know, um, all the stories we hear about people being, you know, being people and uh, acting out on, on planes that's about, about to you and your colleagues, you know, of doing that in these these times. It's uh, it's not easy. We're very, Thank we're you. very polarized, aren't we? And uh, But most people are really nice and yeah. easy going. So, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's better out there than we think it is. It's just yeah. the few people and it's my responsibility. As you said, it's how you react. Yeah. And it works. It actually works like a charm when you don't react. <laughs> I think it's a, that's, that's a great, great thing to think about, which we often forget when we get caught up, we, you know, we, we center on, we focus on this person as though they represented the totality of humanity, really. And, and as you're saying, if you re re reflect that, 
you know, for this person behaving, quote, badly, this, the hundred or a thousand people behaving kindly and generously. I shared about that last week of traveling out to the West Coast and just seeing so, so much kindness as well. So I mean, just small, you know, what Danusha Lameris in that poem, Small Kindnesses, speaks about these just small things, not huge heroic things, but just small kindnesses that really help help the world go round, really. And, and I think that if we can shift out of the, the, the mind state of what's wrong to, to what's working, you know, what is going well, what's where people are being kind, then it really shifts our whole attitude to things. So, so thank you again, Pamela. And um, I think, um, was it uh, Diane uh, in North Carolina wanted to share? Yes. Hi, Diane. Hi. Um, what I'm working with right now about letting go is um, I've had two surgeries in the past like six, seven weeks related to cancer diagnosis. And I'm done with the surgeries and probably most of the major treatments. And now I am home and healing and I want to be back the way I was <laughs> in terms of you know, somehow I didn't anticipate the after all this part that, you know, my body's not operating the way I'm used to. My arms don't have full range of motion. My energy is crap. I want to be outside enjoying these days and going for walks and mowing the grass and, and you know, all the things I used to be able to do. And I'll go, and I know I'll be able to get back to that before too long. I am so damn impatient. <laughs> just like, um, and I'm just having, and I don't know why I think, you know, I've always been healthy and strong, so I'm supposed to just power through this and be healthy and strong and bounce back like that. Um, but I'm having to accept my humanness and my vulnerabilities and that healing takes time. It's a process. and. I wouldn't be impatient with somebody else about it. Um, or, but it's just hard for me to be still. Um, it just feels like glacial speed to me. Um, and so I'm trying to hold my impatience with some compassion. I can't um, totally let go of my impatience. It keeps popping back up, but it's, I'm just trying to be kind to myself and do the things I can do and try to let other people support me. So. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. I think you're, I mean, I think, I, I, yeah, it sounds like you're, you're, you're going in, in definitely in the right direction. I think the, the heart practices are so important, loving kindness and compassion. When we do get caught up in, you know, impatience or things should be different. I want to be here, but I'm here, you know, I'm just just coming back over and over again, just coming back. This just these simple practices, putting the hand on the heart, maybe just wishing yourself well, you know, maybe just a word, you know, peace or kindness or acceptance. And just just keep coming back and coming back. And and over time, I mean, because we've we've trained ourselves typically to and habitually to you know, I want this, I need this, it needs to happen now. Um, to be in this kind of, often it's an impatient mode. We want things to happen, you know, right away. And to change that, it actually takes some time. So just that repetition, you know, okay, here, just here now. Breathe, take a deeper breath. Can I just be with this? The mind goes off again. Yeah, but, 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 okay, back again. And so yeah, I think you know the practice and you yeah, just have to keep remembering, you know, just remembering kindness, remembering compassion, remembering that we can come back again and again. So I wish you, I'm sure all of us here really wish you well in your recovery, Diane, and send you, you know, feel, feel the community holding you as well, because that can be a powerful support too. Because the illusion when we're suffering, we really think we're alone, don't we? 
that's the big illusion. We think I'm doing this all on my own. And just remembering that, you know, so much of the practice is just remembering. We know it in some way, but we forget, you know, we get caught or caught up again. Just remember, okay, I'm not alone, kindness coming back. So yeah, thank you for sharing that, Diane, and, and really wishing you well, wishing everyone well who's experiencing challenges right now. Just looking at the time, let's just have a couple of quiet minutes of meditation together, and then we'll have a few, um, a few announcements to finish. So taking, taking a moment to maybe close your eyes, Maybe taking a deeper breath or two. And just holding, meeting whatever is present right now with kindness, making space for it, whatever is here. As you breathe in, you might Wish yourself well. Could be, may I be happy, may I be kind to myself. May I be held in loving kindness. Or it could be just a word, peace or love or kindness. Take that in with an in-breath. And as you breathe out, just wishing everyone else well. May you be happy. May you be safe. May you be held in loving kindness. May you live with ease and with kindness. This is from Dana Falls, walk slowly. It only takes a reminder to breathe, a moment to be still and just like that, something in me settles, softens, makes space for imperfection. The harsh voice of judgment drops to a whisper and I remember again that life isn't a re relay race, that we will all cross the finish line that waking up to life is what we were born for. As many times as I forget, catch myself charging forward without even knowing where I'm going, that many times I can make the choice to stop, to breathe, to be, and walk slowly into the mystery. So just remembering to stop, to breathe, to come back, to begin again, moment to moment, in any moment. And I just have two brief things before passing it on. Um, my uh, class begins uh, a week from tomorrow uh, on the Eightfold Path, the key practice of the Buddha to, to find an end to suffering in our lives. It begins on a week from Monday, a week from tomorrow um, for eight weeks. So um, we'll put that into the chat. Um, uh, invite you to join us. We have a nice group for, for that. Um, still time to sign up to register. And then just um, a reminder that uh, these classes are all offered freely um, without any set cost. You're, you're invited if you're able and if you're inclined to, to um, give dana or generosity um, 
which helps to keep the teachings going. And it's how the teachings have come down to us through 2,500 years through this practice of generosity. So thank you for your kindness and generosity, your support. Thank you to um, Haverly and to Pat and to Emily, of course, as always, and Ronnie with the flowers and everyone who supports the class, Michelle and Dan and, and everyone, anyone I'm, I'm missing.